Good morning, friends. Good morning, and thank you so much for joining me. It is the summer, and we are uh, all in coronavirus territory and vacationing and doing the best we can. So, and so am I. Um, Lou, are you there? I am. I am. Great, great. How are you, Lou? I'm doing very well. Enjoying the summer weather and a little chance to get out, which we haven't had. That's right. The weather is getting better and better. Yep. So today we're still on chapter six, which was the chapter on meditation and learning to quieten your mind so that you can start to become more spiritual. Um, and we are now on verse 19. And verse 19 says, as a lamp in a windless place does not flicker. So it's talking here about a yogi with his mind being subdued practicing union with the Atman. So in verse 19 through 24, they're talking about, Krishna talks about a controlled mind remaining peaceful. Now, the Gita and the Upanishads... Give, give me that verse again, because it's excellent, by the way. It's an excellent okay. analogy. As a lamp in a windless place does not flicker. Hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. And don't forget that this was written thousands of years BCE. The Gita itself is thought to be uh, 3,101 BCE. Wow. Um, and and it, some people say it's longer, but usually the Gita takes its uh, similes and other uh, points of teachings from the Upanishads. And the Upanishads uh, are told to us to be much older than that. So no other religions were present at the time. And this analogy of the lamp and the flame and the, uh, uh, the glass that protects the flame is something that was then, there were no temples back then. Everybody said, just pray within yourself, go within yourself to look. There were no churches, no mosques, no synagogues. Um, and so when the temples came about, the temples, a Hindu temple, if you look at it, when you go from the, there's various circles and the innermost sanctum is perfectly pitch dark and the murti, the idol, the atman is v black in color, made of black stone. Mm. And in order to go there, the priest only allows certain people, certain people who are supposedly self-realized and only those people can go in there. The analogies are similes are pretty evident that you're outside looking in, hoping to get to see the Atman, only when the priest takes a lamp, which is knowledge, and does arti with it, and does uh, prayers with it, with the flame, then you can see the uh, idol from where you're standing. But the knowledge that the priest gives you is what enables you to see through the lamp. So. This is something that is now in every religion, a lamp, a candle, mm -hmm. uh, a wick. And what, did, what do all this mean? The wick itself represents the individual and the oil in which it is or wax are the vasanas and desires. The individual is steeped inside these vasanas and desires. And as the flame, which is the mind, continues to burn, it sucks up the oil or the wax and burns it off with the flame. So the mind, which is the flame, is you being used by the individual to suck up the vasanas and the desires and get rid of them. That's the flame, the mind. And the glass covering the flame is the intellect. So this verse 19 says, just as a lamp in a windless place does not flicker. And if there's wind, as long as you cover the flame with the intellect or the glass, right. yep. then the flame doesn't flicker. So um, then in the Indian temples, you when the priest brings the flame around to everybody, what they do is they put both hands over the flame uh, as if to envelop it, and then take that those hands and touch them to their eyes or their forehead. And essentially that symbolizes I'm gaining the knowledge that the priest is giving me and taking it in through my eyes and is going through to my brain. So these are all symbolic explanations. Many people... Indians, Hindus who go to temples don't know this. And I assume it's something similar in a Christian church, Lou. Yeah. Tell me if I'm wrong. 
No, I don't think you're wrong. And these rituals help, uh, again, I help attenuating focus, right? Which is the main goal here. That's right. That's yep. right. And they bind obsessions and compulsions, each of rituals. Yep. So the mind says there's a lot of noise and turbulence and agitation because it has desires. Just imagine a little child. I'm here on vacation with my grandchildren right now, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of noise. I was telling Lou before, a <laughs> <laughs> lot of noise. And I want this, I want this, I want this. And this, I want it, want it, want it. This noise is causing most of your disturbance inside your head, right. whether you realize mm -hmm. it or not. It's this disturbance that you say, I want peace from it. Um, of your kids of your, of your grandchildren's age don't have any governors on this yet. And hopefully, as, as you go along, you learn to control those impulses and that pleasure seeking as you go along. To some extent. So, yes, as you get older, your intellect is able to control the simpler uh, demands of the mind. But the main focus in yeah. terms of power, in terms of more beauty, money, wealth, physical desires that the body wants to uh, fulfill, those are hard for the intellect to control unless it becomes stronger and is uh, trained to become this way. Right. So once you acquire, so uh, let's say that a man is uh, a smoker and he's in the plane and he says, I need a cigarette, I need a cigarette, I need a cigarette. That desire is so loud in his mind. The minute he steps off the plane and he puts a cigarette to his mouth and he lights it, the desire ceases. Yeah. And immediately he says, ah, I'm in heaven. Not because of the cigarette itself, because that even hasn't entered his system. The nicotine has to go through his lungs, into his lungs, and then be absorbed and go to his brain. Just putting the cigarette to his lips and lighting it with a match. And he says, ah, I'm in heaven. So He's the, free from the desire. It's so the, the noise is torturing him. Yeah. That's right. The noise of the desire that has been torturing him has stopped. And so there is a brief bliss. So all of these desires, friends, recognize that whichever desire you have, it gets a brief period of bliss when it's achieved, and then right away another desire starts. So there's no cessation to this noise within your head. I can tell you, I used to think when I was a kid, um, major exam coming up and used to study, study, study and say, I can't wait till the exams are over and I get my results and I've passed. Yeah. And I say, I will be in heaven once I know I've passed. I'll be so happy. And when the result came out, it says you've passed and you've got great marks, if I did, the bliss would be lasting for a few minutes. Right. And then immediately I would pretend to still be happy. Say, I got to celebrate. I have to go to the movies. That's what was my celebration. Yeah. I have to go to the movies. I have to buy myself a Coca-Cola or whatever. That was my celebration. But it was all put on. The bliss was no longer there. Right. Uh, immediately the desire was for Coca-Cola or going to the movies or something else. Um, so recognize that this flame the mind keeps wavering, depends on the winds, which are the desires that keep making it move. And if you fall prey to that, if you fall prey to that, then your mind continues to waver, cannot concentrate. So that was verse 19. Verse 20. Verse 20 says, when the mind is controlled by discipline of yoga, when the mind is controlled by discipline of yoga, it quietens down and sees the self and is satisfied. So by doing yoga and practice of meditation, the mind sees, the intellect sees the self, the Atman, and is satisfied. So when it becomes one with the self, with the Atman, the mind becomes totally at peace, it is fulfilled, it is happy. So it's always seeking contact with the sense objects. Nothing is ever enough. No matter how much wealth a person has, he always seeks more wealth. No matter how much beauty a person has, he or she always seeks more beauty. No matter how much fame that person has, they always seek more fame or power or each one of these things. Any contact with any object, ice cream, gulab jamun, uh, rice and dal, you just want more and more and more of your favorite subject. And whenever you get it, you experience it, there's a short period of bliss because that noise in your head has stopped and then there's another desire that comes up. Mm -hmm. So 
the key here is to recognize that we're always looking to get something in the future. Remember this, friends. You are, this is what's called bondage. You're bound to the something in the future that you're hoping to get. And your happiness is bound to that achievement of that something in the future. You say, when I get that, I'll be happy. Right. Write this down, underline it, because it's very, it was very important to me to recognize. When I get this, I'll be happy, which means that one is not happy right now. And recognize that you're bound to that future acquisition or enjoyment in order for you to be happy or peaceful. But no, it doesn't happen. The mind is insatiable. It's never enough. You're always, the mind is disturbed for what it doesn't have. And if it gets it, it's fearful for what, for losing what it has gotten. Remember that. So you're afraid. You get it. You say, ah, I hope I don't lose it now. When you don't have it, you're disturbed by it. So either way, you're bound. And this binding is what causes you uh, unhappiness. So how do you change that? The first thing is to get away from your selfishness. The selfishness that you don't think you have, you do have, because everything is me and mine. And if you're better in your relationships, your relationships at work with the people that you work with, in your family, your neighborhood, your friends, if you're better to other people, automatically, slowly, slowly, you become less selfish. There's less me, less mine, and this noise starts to reduce. So the test of spirituality is what? The test of spirituality, how spiritual you are, is self-sufficiency for your own happiness. Mm -hmm. That your happiness is not dependent, is not bound to external factors, right. either present or in the future. So because whatever that's you that's have- a good summary, isn't it? Happiness is not external. Happiness is not external. There's I just nothing saw external that's going to give you true happiness. Yeah, yeah. The, the, there's a cartoon I just saw that there's a boy and a girl, and the boy is standing next to the girl saying, looking very wistfully and saying, hey, where did you find that? Where did you get it? I've been looking for it for a long time. And she says, oh, you mean happiness? <laughs> I just created it. Yes. So you can't find it. You can't find it in something. You have to create it within yourself. You have to work at this. You have to, you have to create these relationships that are selfless and less selfish in order for you to get happy. Because don't forget, friends, whatever you have, you should be so grateful for. Tomorrow, one could lose one's job. You, for nothing, no reason, you could lose your job. You could go to a doctor, God forbid, and get a diagnosis that you have terminal cancer. Something could happen to your family. Hope all of this doesn't apply to you. And But it can happen. It does happen. I can tell you somebody very close to me owned a big restaurant, was very successful, had a lot of money coming in, and essentially was pretty comfortable that the restaurant had been paid off, everything was going well, there was lots of money coming in, there didn't seem to be any danger on right. the horizon. And yet, when coronavirus hit, the first thing that was hit after airlines and stuff like that was restaurants. Mm -hmm. it had to be shut down. The, the expenses couldn't be met because there were no... And, and things change on a dime. Right. So friends, remember that. Things can change in our lives. When India and Pakistan um, were separated by the British before they left, and people had to run from what was then India and is now Pakistan back to India, there were murders of Hindus by the Muslims, murders of Muslims by the Hindus, and this continued, and people lost a lot, lost everything in that exodus. So never would they have ever imagined that they could lose something that they've saved, they've protected, they said everything is safe, it's in the bank, right. nothing is safe, nothing is safe. So last example I want to give you for this verse of 20 is that of Lord Ganesh. Now, many of you who recognize the statue of Lord Ganesh has, Lou, for if you don't know, Lord Ganesh is the son of Shiva, Mm -hmm. Lord Shiva and Parvati, 
and he has an elephant head. It's a mythological right. story. And in the mythological story, Shiva, in a fit of anger, not knowing that this was his son, this, the boy answered back to him. He said, I'm going to chop your head off. If you talk to me like this, don't allow me to go inside my house because he was standing guard. And then he cut his head off. The mother came out and she screamed and she said, why did you do that? And he said, oh, I didn't know. I was away in the mountains meditating for 12 years. I didn't know or for however many years. So he then picked the head of an elephant and put it on the little boy. And that became Lord Ganesh. Mm -hmm. A lot of symbolic um, uh, explanations to that for another time. But Lord Ganesh is thought to have the head of an elephant and, and that we can talk about some other time to say why, what did these things mean? The Lord, a head of an elephant, trunk, etc. But in any statue or photograph or picture of Ganesh, at his feet is a plate of goodies, desserts. And next to the plate of goodies and desserts is a mouse or a rat yeah. looking up at Ganesh with his hands folded. Many people don't know what this means. The mouse or rat Re, um, re, it symbolizes the mind. And why the mind? Because rodents, squirrels, mice, rats are never satisfied with what they have. They're always running, even at the risk of their own life. They run across the street to gather acorns, nuts, etc. They run back to wherever and hide it, saying, I'll need it sometime in the future. Mm -hmm. Then they run out again. What happens is they don't remember where they've hidden their things. They think they've collected a fortune, but they don't know where they've put these nuts and acorns. So they're always running and they're always not satisfied. They're always looking for more and more because they don't know what they have. Right. So Hindu mythology analogized the mind to that of a rodent, a rat, and said, your mind is like that of a rat. It's never enough. You keep wanting more and more and more, and you don't recognize how much you have. So a controlled, self-realized person, such as Ganesh, has his mind, the mouse, at, the, at his feet. And his hands are folded to the intellect, saying, even though there's a plate of dessert right next to me, I will not allow, the mind will not allow itself to participate or the body or the senses in these delicious desserts until you, God, the intellect, Atman, allows me to. So the mind is at complete control of the Sri Ganesh. So that is what verse 20 is talking about in terms of um, having its mind under complete control. So that's verse 20. So verse 21 let me see if I've left out anything. <laughs> 21 says, when the yogi feels the bliss of the self, the intellect recognizes this bliss, and that bliss is a beyond the happiness offered by all the senses. The mind and the intellect then never moves from that. So here he says that the intellect recognizes the Atman, not literally. The intellect cannot get the uh, recognition of the, of the uh, Atman. It can only become the Atman. So it says, and once it does that, once it recognizes the Atman, it never moves from that. So what does that mean? It's like going into a, a blind man, going into a big hall. You know these big halls they have, Lou, like the VFW or yep. places like that? Right. And it's freezing, it's winter. But there's a fireplace somewhere and somebody tells the blind person, go, go inside this room, go stand near the fireplace without recognizing that since he's blind, he won't know where the fireplace is. But will he not know? Sure, he will, because even though he's blind and he can't see it, he can't perceive it with his eyes, his body says, I can feel the heat. And it starts drawing him towards the fireplace. And as he gets closer to the fireplace, it gets warmer and warmer until he gets right next to it. He knows that I'm right next to the fireplace. Similarly, as the intellect starts with meditation to recognize that the mind is getting further and further under its control, and the intellect recognizes the peace and the bliss that it sees, it recognizes it, and it recognizes that that peace 
is beyond the happiness offered by all the senses, is what this verse is saying. Verse 21. And the mind and intellect never moves from that, and it never forgets it. So what this is suggesting is that you cannot perceive, you cannot see the Atman, you cannot hear the Atman, you cannot smell the Atman, cannot taste the Atman, cannot touch the Atman. Mm -hmm. The mind cannot have the emotions of love for from the Atman. You can feel the love for wanting to get there, but you can't feel emotionally the Atman. Right. And you can't even have an idea through your intellect of what the Atman is like. You can only become the Atman. So, and once you get there, you can never forget it. Once you get there, it's like learning to read. Right. No matter when you are learn to read, at any time I say, you haven't read a book in years. Have you forgotten? You will never forget to read. You'll never forget to swim. You'll never forget to ride a bike. So similarly, once you have been become the Atman, you can never forget that. Um, just like a dream state. In a dream state, if you somebody were to tell you, perceive the waking state, you can't. Think of, through your mind, the emotions associated with the waking state. You can only perceive and, and think what you are like in the dream state. You right. can't even understand what the dream, waking state is like. It is only once you wake up that you become, perceive it, think it, feel it, all of that through your body, mind, and intellect in terms of the waking state. You cannot do it while you're still dreaming. So Vedanta is analogized in the scriptures to that of a pole vaulter. Uh, everybody knows what a pole vaulter does. He takes a long pole, runs, sticks the pole in the ground, pushes himself up with the pole, gets to this high bar, mm -hmm. swings his body over the bar, lets go of the pole, and then falls to the other side. So without that pole, he cannot get to the top of that pole vault. And with the pole, once he's gotten to the top, he cannot take the pole with him. Right. So he has to let go at the top of the pole, but he can't do it without the pole. So Vedanta is considered to be that. That Vedanta gets you to the top, but you have to get rid of or release yourself from even Vedanta when you're at the top in order to cross over to the other side. And that, that is one reason why it's also called Vedanta. It means the end. Anta means end end of the Vedas or the end for you in terms of all knowledge once you have gotten to that point. Mm -hmm. So even the greatest of dangers or sorrows are not felt by the um, person who becomes self-realized. Even the greatest danger or sorrow does not affect such a person. Now, what that means is people say, oh, he doesn't feel sad at all. His wife dies, his son dies, his you know, family dies. That's not true. He right. feels it, but he doesn't let it affect him. It doesn't affect his, his um, personality. It doesn't affect his way, what he ought to do. So that is the end of verse 21. We're going to stop here. And I thank you for listening. Lou, did you want to say anything? No, this was a, this was an excellent. I, I like this show today. I, I loved where we started, where our lamp in a windless place does not flicker. It's exactly what we're trying to achieve as we move towards meditation and self-realization, right? To Thank lower you. that wind on our flame. Thank you so much for saying that. Thanks to the Gita and the Upanishads for teaching us this. And I thank you all for listening, and we will continue next time.